The Five Senses by E. Nesbitt Professor Boyd Thompson's services to the cause of science are usually spoken of as inestimable, and so indeed they probably are, since in science, as in the rest of life, one thing leads to another, and you never know where anything is going to stop. At any rate, inestimable or not, they are world-renowned, and he with them. The discoveries which he gave to his time are a matter of common knowledge among biological experts, and the sudden ending of his experimental activities caused a few days' wonder, even in lay circles. Quite unintelligent people told each other that it seemed a pity, and persons on omnibuses exchanged commonplaces starred with his name. But the real meaning and cause of that ending have been studiously hidden, as well as the events which immediately preceded it. A veil has been drawn over all the things that people would have liked to know, and it is only now that circumstances so arrange themselves as to make it possible to tell the whole story. I propose to avail myself of this possibility. It will serve no purpose for me to explain how the necessary knowledge came into my possession, but I will say that the story was only in part pieced together by me. Another hand is responsible for much of the detail, and for a certain occasional emotionalism, which is, I believe, wholly foreign to my own style. In my original statement of the following facts, I dealt fully, as I am, I may say without immodesty, qualified to do so, with all the scientific points of the narrative. But these details were judged, unwisely as I think, to be needless to the expert, and unintelligible to the ordinary reader, and have therefore been struck out, the merest hints being left as necessary links in the story. This appears to me to destroy most of its interest, but I admit that the illusions are perhaps justified. I have no desire to assist or encourage callow students in such experiments as those by which Professor Boyd Thompson brought his scientific career to an end. Incredible as it may appear, Professor Boyd Thompson was once a little boy who wore white embroidered frocks and blue sashes. In that state he caught flies and pulled off their wings to find out how they flew. He did not find out, and Lucilla, his little girl cousin, also in white frocks, cried over the dead, dismembered flies and buried them in little paper coffins. Later he wore a Holland blouse with a belt of leather and watched the development of tadpoles in a tin bath in a stable yard. A microscope was, on his eighth birthday, presented to him by an affluent uncle. The uncle showed him how to surprise the secrets of a drop of pond water, which, limpid to the eye, confessed under the microscope to a whole cosmogony of strenuous and undesirable careers. At the age of ten, Arthur Boyd Thompson was sent to a private school, its headmaster an acolyte of science, who esteemed himself to be a high priest of Huxley and Tyndall, a devotee of Darwin. Thence to the choice of medicine as a profession was, when the choice was insisted on by the elder Boyd Thompson, a short, plain step. Inorganic chemistry failed to charm, and under the cloak of medicine and surgery, the growing fever of scientific curiosity could be sated on bodies other than the cloak-wearers. He became a medical student, and an enthusiast for vivisection. The bow of Apollo was not always bent. In a rest interval, the summer vacation to be exact, he met again the cousin, second once removed, Lucilla, and loved her. They were betrothed. It was a long, bright summer, full of sunshine, garden parties, picnics, archery, a decaying amusement, and croquet, then coming to its own. He exulted in the distinction already present in his career, but some half-formed, wholly unconscious desire to shine with increased lustre in the eyes of the beloved caused him to invite, for the holiday's ultimate week, a fellow student, one who knew and could testify to the quality of the laurels already encircling the head of a young scientist. The friend came, testified, and, in a vibrating interview, under the lime-trees of Lucilla's people's garden, Mr. Boyd Thompson learned that Lucilla never could, never would, 
love or marry a vivisectionist. The moon hung low and yellow in the spacious calm of the sky. The hour was propitious, the lovers fond. Mr. Boyd Thompson vowed that his scientific research should henceforth deal wholly with departments into which the emotions of the non-scientific cannot enter. He went back to London, and within the week bought four dozen frogs, twelve guinea pigs, five cats, and a spaniel. His scientific aspirations met his love longings, and did not fight them. You cannot fight beings of another world. He took part in a debate on blood pressure, which created some little stir in medical circles, spoke eloquently, and distinction surrounded him with a halo. He wrote to Lucilla three times a week, took his degree, and published that celebrated paper of his, which set the whole scientific world by the ears, The Action of Choline on the Nervous System, I think its name was. Lucilla surreptitiously subscribed to a press-cutting agency for all snippets of print relating to her lover. Three weeks after the publication of that paper, which really was the beginning of Professor Boyd Thompson's fame, she wrote to him from her home in Kent. Arthur, you have been doing it again. You know how I love you, and I believe you love me, but you must choose between loving me and torturing dumb animals. If you don't choose right, then it's good-bye, and God forgive you. Your poor Lucilla, who loved you very dearly. He read the letter, and the human heart in him winced and whined. Yet not so deeply now, nor so loudly, but that he bethought himself to seek out a friend and pupil, who would watch certain experiments, attend to the cutting of certain sections, before he started for Tenterden where she lived. There was no station at Tenterden in those days, but a twelve-mile walk did not dismay him. Lucilla's home was one of those houses of brave proportions and an inalienable bourgeois stateliness, which stand back a little from the noble high street of that most beautiful of Kentish towns. He came there pleasantly exercised, his boots dusty and his throat dry, and stood on a snowy doorstep beneath the Jacobean lintel. He looked down the wide, beautiful street, raised eyebrows, and shrugged uneasy shoulders within his professional frock-coat. "'It's all so difficult,' he said to himself. Lucilla received him in a drawing-room scented with last year's rose-leaves, and fresh with chintz that had been washed a dozen times. She stood, very pale and frail, her blonde hair was not teased into fluffiness, and rounded over the chignon of the period, but banded Madonna-wise, crowning her with heavy, burnished plaits. Her gown was of white muslin, and round her neck black velvet passed, supporting a gold locket. He knew whose picture it held. The loose bell sleeves fell away from the slender arms with little black velvet bracelets, and she leaned one hand on a chiffonier of carved rosewood, on whose marble top stood, under a glass case, a Chinese pagoda carved in ivory, and two bohemian glass vases with medallions representing young women nursing pigeons. There were white curtains of darned net. In the fireplace white ravelled muslin spread a cascade brightened with threads of tinsel. A canary sang in a green cage, wainscoted with yellow tarlatan, and two red rosebuds stood in lank specimen glasses on the mantelpiece. Every article of furniture in the room spoke eloquently of the sheltered life, the iron obstinacy of the well brought up. It was a scene that invaded his mental vision many a time, in the laboratory, in the lecture room. It symbolised many things, all dear and all impossible. They talked awkwardly, miserably, and always it came round to this same thing, but you don't mean it, he said, and at last came close to her. I do mean it, she said, very white, very trembling, very determined. But it's my life, he pleaded. It's the life of thousands. You don't understand. I understand that dogs are tortured. I can't bear it. He caught at her hand. Don't, she said, when I think what that hand does. Dearest, 
he said, very earnestly. Which is the more important, a dog or a human being? They're all God's creatures, she flashed, unorthodoxly orthodox. They're all God's creatures, with much more that he heard, and pitied, and smiled at miserably in his heart. You don't understand, he kept saying, stemming the flood of her rhetorical pleadings. Spencer Wells alone has found out wonderful things, just with experiments on rabbits. Don't tell me, she said. I don't want to hear. The conventions of their day forbade that he should tell her anything plainly. He took refuge in generalities. Spencer Wells, that operation he perfected, it restored thousands of women to their husbands, saved thousands of women for their children. I don't care what he's done. It's wrong if it's done in that way. It was on that day that they parted, after more than an hour, and more than two, of mutual misunderstood reiteration. He, she said, was brutal, and besides it was plain that he did not love her. To him she seemed unreasonable, narrow, prejudiced, blind to the high ideals of the new science. Then it's good-bye, he said at last. If I gave way, you'd only despise me, because I should despise myself. It's no good. Good-bye, dear. Good-bye, she said. I know I'm right. You'll know I am, some day. Never, he answered, more moved and in a more diffused sense than he had ever believed he could be. I can't set my pleasure in you against the good of the whole world. If that's all you think of me, she said, and her silk and her muslin whirled from the room. He walked back to Staplehurst, thrilled with the conflict. The thrill died down, went out, and left as ashes a cold resolve. That was the end of Mr. Boyd Thompson's engagement. It was quite by accident that he made his greatest discovery. There are those that hold that all great discoveries are accident, or providence. The terms are, in this connection, interchangeable. He plunged into work to wash away the traces of his soul's wounds, as a man plunges into water to wash off red blood. And he swam there, perhaps, a little blindly. The injection with which he treated that white rabbit was not compounded of the drugs he had intended to use. He could not lay his hand on a thing he wanted, and in that sort of frenzy of experiment, to which no scientific investigator is wholly a stranger, he cast about for a new idea. The thing that came to his hand was a drug that he had never in his normal mind intended to use, an unaccredited, wild, magic medicine, obtained by a missionary from some savage South Sea tribe, and brought home as an example of the ignorance of the heathen. And it worked a miracle. He had been fighting his way through the unbending opposition of known facts. He had been struggling in the shadows. And this discovery was like the blinding light that meets a man's eyes when his pickaxe knocks a hole in a dark cave, and he finds himself face to face with the sun. The effect was undoubted. Now it behooved him to make sure of the cause, to eliminate all those other factors to which that effect might have been due. He experimented cautiously, slowly. These things take years, and the years he did not grudge. He was never tired, never impatient. The slightest variations, the least indications, were eagerly observed, faithfully recorded. His whole soul was in his work. Lucilla was the one beautiful memory of his life. But she was a memory. The reality was this discovery, the accident, the providence. Day followed day, all alike, and yet each taking, almost unperceived, one little step forward, or stumbling into sudden sloughs, those losses and lapses that take days and weeks to retrieve. He was professor, and his hair was grey at the temples, before his achievement rose before him, beautiful, inevitable, austere in its completed splendour, as before the triumphant artist rises the finished work of his art. 
he had found out one of the secrets with which nature has crammed her dark hiding places. He had discovered the hidden possibilities of sensation. In plain English, his researches had led him thus far. He had found, by accident or by providence, the way to intensify sensation. Vaguely, incredulously, he had perceived his discovery. The rabbits and guinea pigs had demonstrated it plainly enough. Then there was a night when he became aware that those results must be checked by something else. He must work out in marble the form which he had worked out in clay. He knew that by this drug, which had, so to speak, thrust itself upon him, he could intensify the five senses of any of the inferior animals. Could he intensify those senses in man? If so, worlds beyond the grasp of his tired mind opened themselves before him. If so, he would have achieved a discovery, made a contribution to the science he had loved so well, and followed at such a cost, a discovery equal to any that any man had ever made. Ferrier and Leo and Horsley, those he would outshine. Galileo, Newton, Harvey. He would rank with these. Could he find a human rabbit to submit to the test? The soul of the man Lucilla had loved turned and revolted. No, he had experimented on guinea pigs and rabbits, but when it came to experimenting on men, there was only one man on whom he chose to use his new-found powers. Himself. At least she would not have it to say that he was a coward or unfair, when it came to the point of what a man could do and dare, could suffer and endure. His big laboratory was silent and deserted. His assistants were gone, his private pupils dispersed. He was alone with the tools of his trade. Shelf on shelf of smooth-stoppered bottles, drugs and stains, the long bench gleaming with beakers, test tubes, and the glass mansions of costly apparatus. In the shadows at the far end of the room, where the last-going assistant had turned off the electric lights, strange shapes lurked, wicker-covered carboys, kinographs, galvanometers. The faintly threatening aspect of delicate, complex machines, all wires and coils and springs, the gaunt form of the pendulum myograph, and certain well-worn tables and copper troughs, for which the moment had no use. He knew that this drug, with others, diversely compounded and applied, produced in animals an abnormal intensification of the senses, that it increased, nay, as it were magnified a thousandfold, the hearing, the sight, the touch, and, he was almost sure, the senses of taste and smell but of the extent of the increase he could form no exact estimate. Should he, to-night, put himself in a position of one able to speak on these points with authority? Or should he go to the Royal Society's meeting, and hear that ass Netherby maunder yet once again about the secretion of lymph? He pulled out his notebook, and laid it open on the bench. He went to the locked cupboard, unfastened it with a bright key that hung instead of seal or charm at his watch-chain. He unfolded a paper, and laid it on the bench where no one coming in could fail to see it. Then he took out little bottles, three, four, five, polished a graduated glass, and dropped into it slow, heavy drops. A larger bottle yielded a medium, in which all mingled. He hardly hesitated at all, before turning up his sleeve and slipping the tiny needle into his arm. He pressed the end of the syringe. The injection was made. Its effect, though not immediate, was sudden. He had to close his eyes, staggered indeed, and was glad of the stool near him, for the drug coursed through him as a hunt in full cry might sweep over untrodden plains. Then suddenly... Everything seemed to settle. He was no longer the helpless scene of incredible meetings, but Professor Boyd Thompson, who had injected a mixture of certain drugs, and was experiencing their effect. His fingers, still holding the glass syringe, sent swift messages to his brain. When he looked down at his fingers, he saw that what they grasped 
was a smooth, slender tube of clear glass. What he felt that they held was a tremendous cylinder, rough to the touch. He wondered, even at the moment, why, if his sense of touch were indeed magnified to this degree, everything did not appear enormous, his ring, his collar. He examined the new phenomenon with cold care. It seemed that only that was enlarged on which his attention, his mind, was fixed. He kept his hand on the glass syringe and thought of his ring, got his mind away from the tube, back again in time to feel it small between his fingers, grow, increase, and become big once more. "'So that's a success,' he said, and saw himself lay the thing down. It lay just in front of the rack of test-tubes, to the eye just that little glass cylinder. To touch it was like a water-pipe on a house-side, and the test-tubes, when he touched them, like the pipes of a great organ." Success, he said again, and mixed the antidote. For he had found the antidote in one of those flashes of intuition, imagination, genius, that light the ways of science as stars light the way of a ship in dark waters. The action of the antidote was enough for one night. He locked the cupboard, and, after all, was glad to listen to the maunderings of Netherby. It had been lonely there, in the atmosphere of complete success. One by one, day by day, he tested the action of his drugs on his other senses. Without being too technical, I had better perhaps explain that the compelling drug was, in each case, one and the same. Its action was directed to this set of nerves or that, by means of the other drugs mixed with it. I trust this is clear. The sense of smell was tested, and his laboratory, with its mingled odours, became abominable to him. Hardly could he stay himself from rushing forth into the outer air, to wash his nostrils in the clear coolness of Hampstead Heath. The sense of taste gave him, magnified a thousand times, the flavour of his after-dinner coffee, and other tastes, distasteful almost beyond the bearing point. But. Success, he said, rinsing his mouth at the laboratory sink after the drinking of the antidote. All along the line, success. Then he tested the action of his discovery on the sense of hearing, and the sound of London came like the roar of a giant. Yet, when he fixed his attention on the movements of a fly, all other sounds ceased, and he heard the sound of the fly's feet on the shelf when it walked. Thus, in turn, he heard the creak of the boards expanding in the heat, the movement of the glass stoppers that kept imprisoned in their proper bottles the giants of acid and alkali. "'Success!' he cried aloud, and his voice sounded in his ears like the shout of a monster overcoming primeval forces. "'Success! Success!' Remained only the eyes— and here, strangely enough, the professor hesitated, faint with a sudden heart-sickness. Following all intensification there must be reaction. What if the reaction exceeded that from which it reacted? What if the wave of tremendous sight, stemmed by the antidote ebbing, left him blind? But the spirit of the explorer in science is the spirit that explores African rivers, and sails amid white bergs to seek the undiscovered pole. He held the syringe with a firm hand, made the required puncture, and braced himself for the result. His eyes seemed to swell to great globes, to dwindle to microscopic globules, to swim in a flood of fire, to shrivel high and dry on a beach of hot sand. Then he saw, and the glass fell from his hand, for the whole of the stable earth seemed to be suddenly set in movement, even the air grew thick with vast, overlapping, shapeless shapes. He opined later that these were the microbes and bacilli that cover and fill all things, in this world that looks so clean and bright. Concentrating his vision, he saw in the one day's little dust on the bottles, 
myriads of creatures, crawling and writhing, alive. The proportions of the laboratory seemed but little altered. Its large lines and forms remained practically unchanged. It was the little things that were no longer little, the invisible things that were now invisible no longer. And he felt grateful, for the first time in his life, for the limits set by nature to the powers of the human body. He had increased those powers. If he let his eyes stray idly about, as one does in the waltz, for example, all was much as it used to be. But the moment he looked steadily at any one thing, it became enormous. He closed his eyes. Success here had gone beyond his wildest dreams. Indeed, he could not but feel that success, taking the bit between its teeth, had perhaps gone just the least little bit too far. And on the next day he decided to examine the drug in all its aspects, to court the intensification of all his senses, which should set him in the position of supreme power over men and things, transform him from a professor into a demigod. The great question was, of course, how the five preparations of his drug would act on or against each other. Would it be intensification, or would they neutralize each other? Like all imaginative scientists, he was working with stuff perilously like the spells of magic, and certain things were not possible to be foretold. Besides, this drug came from a land of mystery, and the knowledge of secrets which we call magic. He did not anticipate any increase in the danger of the experiment. Nevertheless, he spent some hours in arranging and destroying papers, among others, certain pages of the yellow notebook. After dinner, he detained his man as, laden with the last tray, he was leaving the room. "'I may as well tell you, Parker,' the professor said, moved by some impulse he had not expected, "'that you will benefit to some extent by my will, on conditions. If any accident should cut short my life, you will at once communicate with my solicitor, whose name you will now write down. The model man, trained by fifteen years of close personal service, drew forth a notebook as neat as the professor's own, wrote in it neatly the address the professor gave. Anything more, sir? he asked, looking up, pencil in hand. No, said the professor. Nothing more. Good night, Parker. Good night, sir said the model man. The next words the model man opened his lips to speak were breathed into the night-tube of the nearest doctor. My master, Professor Boyd Thompson, could you come round at once, sir? I'm afraid it's very serious. It was half-past six when the nearest doctor, Jones was his unimportant name, stooped over the lifeless body of the professor. He shook his head as he stood up, and looked round the private laboratory on whose floor the body lay. "'His researches are over,' he said. "'Yes, he's dead. Been dead some hours. When did you find him?' "'I went to call my master as usual,' said Parker. "'He rises at six, summer and winter, sir. He was not in his room, and the bed had not been slept in. So I came in here, sir. It is not unusual for my master to work all night, when he has been very interested in his experiments, and then he likes his coffee at six. "'I see,' said Dr. Jones. "'Well, you'd better rouse the house and fetch his own doctor. "'It's heart failure, of course, "'but I dare say he'd like to sign the certificate himself.' "'Can nothing be done?' said Parker, much affected. "'Nothing,' said Dr. Jones. "'It's the common lot. "'You'll have to look out for another situation.' "'Yes, sir,' said Parker. "'He told me only last night what I was to do "'in case of anything happening to him. "'I wonder if he had any idea.' "'Some premonition, perhaps,' the doctor corrected. "'The funeral was a very quiet one. "'So the late Professor Boyd Thompson had decreed in his will. "'He had arranged all details. "'The body was to be clothed in flannel, "'placed in an open coffin, covered only with a linen sheet, "'and laid in the family mausoleum, "'a moss-grown building, in the midst of a little park, "'which surrounded Boyd Grange, "'the birthplace of the Boyd Thompsons.' A little property in Sussex it was. The professor sometimes went there for weekends. 
he had left this property to Lucilla, with a last love letter, in which he begged her to give his body the hospitality of the death house, now hers with the rest of the estate. To Parker he left an annuity of two hundred pounds, on the condition that he should visit and enter the mausoleum once in every twenty-four hours, for fourteen days after the funeral. To this end, the late professor's solicitor decided that Parker had better reside at Boyd Grange for the said fortnight, and Parker, whose nerves seemed to be shaken, petitioned for company. This made easy the arrangement which the solicitor desired to make, of a witness to the carrying out of Parker, of the provisions of the dead man's will. The solicitor's clerk was quite good company, and arm in arm with him Parker paid his first visit to the mausoleum. The little building stands in a glade of evergreen oaks. The trees are old and thick, and the narrow door is deep in shadow, even on the sunniest day. Parker went to the mausoleum, peered through its square grating, but he did not go in. Instead he listened, and his ears were full of silence. "'He's dead right enough,' he said, with a doubtful glance at his companion. "'You ought to go in, oughtn't you?' said the solicitor's clerk. "'Go in yourself if you like, Mr. Pollock,' said Parker, suddenly angry. "'Anyone who likes can go in, but it won't be me. If he was alive it'd be different. I'd have done anything for him. But I ain't going in among all those dead and mouldering Thompsons. See? If we both say I did, it'll be just the same as me doing it.' "'So it will.' said the solicitor's clerk. But where do I come in? Parker explained to him where he came in, to their mutual content. Right you are, said the clerk. On those terms I'm fly. And if we both say you did it, we needn't come to the beastly place again, he added, shivering and glancing over his shoulder at the door with the grating. No more we need, said Parker. Behind the bars of the narrow door, lay deeper shadows than those of the ilexes outside. And in the blackest of the shadow lay a man whose every sense was intensified, as though by a magic potion. For when the professor swallowed the five variants of his great discovery, each acted as he had expected it to act. But the union of the five vehicles, conveying the drug to the nerves, which served his five senses, had paralysed every muscle. His hearing, taste, touch, scent, and sight were intensified a thousandfold, as they had been in the individual experiments. But the man who felt all this exaggerated increase of sensation was powerless as a cat under Kirali. He could not raise a finger, stir an eyelash. More, he could not breathe, nor did his body advise him of any need of breathing. And he had lain thus immobile and felt his body slowly grow cold, had heard in thunder the voices of Parker and the doctor, had felt the enormous hands of those who made his death toilet, had smelt intolerably the camphor and lavender that they laid round him in the narrow black bed, had tasted the mingled flavours of the drug and its five mediums, and, in an ecstasy of magnified sensation, had made the lonely train journey which coffins make, and known himself carried into the mausoleum, and left there alone. And every sense was intensified, even his sense of time, so that it seemed to him that he had lain there for many years, and the effect of the drugs showed no sign of any diminution or reaction. Why had he not left directions for the injection of the antidote? It was one of those slips which wreck campaigns, caused the discovery of hidden crimes. It was a slip, and he had made it. He had thought of death, but in all the results he had anticipated, death's semblance had found no place. Well, he had made his bed, and he must lie on it. This narrow bed, whose scent of clean oak and French polish, was distinct among the musty intolerable odours of the charnel house. It was perhaps twenty hours that he had lain there, powerless, immobile, listening to the sounds of unexplained movements about him, when he felt, with a joy almost like delirium, a faint quivering in the eyelids. 
they had closed his eyes, and till now they had remained closed. Now, with an effort, as of one who lifts a gravestone, he raised his eyelids. They closed again quickly, for the roof of the vault, at which he gazed earnestly, was alive with monsters. Spiders, earwigs, crawling beetles and flies, far too small to have been perceived by normal eyes, spread giant forms over him. He closed his eyes and shuddered. It felt like a shudder, but no one who had stood beside him could have noted any movement. It was then that Parker came, and went. Professor Boyd Thompson heard Parker's words, and lay listening to the thunder of Parker's retreating feet. He tried to move, to call out, but he could not. He lay there helpless, and somehow he thought of the dark end of the laboratory, where the assistant before leaving had turned out the electric lights. He had nothing but his thoughts. He thought how he would lie there, and die there. The place was sequestered, no one passed that way. Parker had failed him, and the end was not hard to picture. He might recover all his faculties, might be able to get up, able to scream, to shout, to tear at the bars. The bars were strong, and Parker would not come again. Well, he would try to face with a decent bravery, whatever had to be faced. Time, measureless, spread round. It seemed as though someone had stopped all the clocks in the world, as though he were not in time, but in eternity. Only by the waxing and waning light he knew of the night and the day. His brain was weary with the effort to move, to speak, to cry out. He lay, informed with something like despair or fortitude. And then Parker came again, and this time a key grated in the lock. The professor noted with rapture that it sounded no louder than a key should sound, turned in a lock that was rusty. Nor was the voice other than he had been used to hear it, when he was man alive and Parker's master, and— "'You can go in, of course, if you wish it, miss,' said Parker, disapprovingly. "'But it's not what I should advise myself. For me it's different,' he added, on a sudden instinct of self-preservation. "'I've got to go in, every day for a fortnight,' he added, pitying himself. "'I will go in, thank you,' said a voice. "'Yes, give me the candle, please. And you need not wait. I will lock the door when I come out." Thus the voice spoke, and the voice was Lucilla's. In all his life the Professor had never feared death or its trappings. Neither its physical repulsiveness, nor the supernatural terrors which cling about it, had he either understood or tolerated. But now, in one little instant, he did understand. He heard Lucilla come in. A light held near him shone warm and red through his closed eyelids, and he knew that he had only to unclose those eyelids to see her face bending over him. And he could unclose them. Yet he would not. He lay there, still and straight in his coffin, and life swept through him in waves of returning power. Yet he lay like death. For he said, or something in him said, she believes me dead. If I open my eyes, it will be like a dead man looking at her. If I move, it will be a dead man moving under her eyes. People have gone mad for less. Lie still, lie still, he told himself. Take any risks for yourself. There must be none for her. She had taken the candle away, set it down somewhere at a distance, and now she was kneeling beside him, and her hand was under his head. He knew he could raise his arm and clasp her, and Parker would come back, perhaps, when she did not return to the house, come back to find a man in grave clothes clasping a mad woman. He lay still. Then her kisses and tears fell on his face, and she murmured broken words of love and longing. But he lay still. At any cost he must lie still, even at the cost of his own sanity his own life. And the warmth of her hand under his head, her face against his, 
her kisses, her tears, set his blood flowing evenly and strongly. Her other arm lay on his breast, softly pressing over his heart. He would not move, he would be strong. If he would be saved, it must be by some other way, not this. Suddenly, tears and kisses ceased. Her every breath seemed to have stopped with these. She had drawn away from him. She spoke. Her voice came from above him. She was standing up. Arthur, she said, Arthur. Then he opened his eyes, the narrowest chink. But he could not see her. Only he knew she was moving towards the door. There had been a new quality in her tone, a thrill of fear, or hope was it, or at least of uncertainty. Should he move? Should he speak? He dared not. He knew too well the fear that the normal human being has of death and the grave, the fear transcending love, transcending reason. Her voice was farther away now. She was by the door. She was leaving him. If he let her go, it was an end of hope for him. If he did not let her go, an end perhaps of reason for her. No. Arthur, she said, I don't believe. I believe you can hear me. I'm going to get a doctor. If you can speak, speak to me. Her speaking ended, cut off short as a cord is cut by a knife. He did not speak. He lay in a conscious, forced rigidity. Speak if you can, she implored. Just one word. Then he said very faintly, very distinctly, in a voice that seemed to come from a great way off, Lucilla. And at the word she screamed aloud pitifully, and leapt for the entrance, and he heard the rustle of her crepe in the narrow door. Then he opened his eyes wide and raised himself on his elbow. Very weak he was, and trembling exceedingly. To his ears her scream held the note of madness. Vainly he had refrained. Selfishly he had yielded. The cold hand of a mortal faintness clutched at his heart. I don't want to live now, he told himself, and fell back in the straight bed. Her arms were round him. I'm going to get help, she said, her lips to his ear. Brandy and things. Only I came back. I didn't want you to think I was frightened. Oh, my dear, thank God, thank God. He felt her kisses, even through the swooning mist that swelled about him. Had she really fled in terror? He never knew. He knew that she had come back to him. That is the real, true and authentic narrative of the events which caused Professor Boyd Thompson to abandon a brilliant career, to promise anything that Lucilla might demand, and to devote himself entirely to a gentlemanly and unprofitable farming, and to his wife. From the point of view of the scientific world, it is a sad ending to much promise. But, at any rate, there are two happy people hand in hand at the story's ending. There is no doubt that, for several years, Professor Boyd Thompson had had enough of science, and, by a natural revulsion, flung himself into the full tide of commonplace sentiment. But genius, like youth, cannot be denied. And I, for one, am doubtful whether the professor's renunciation of research will be a lasting one. Already I have heard whispers of a laboratory which is being built onto the house beyond the billiard room. But I am inclined to believe the rumours which assert that, for the future, his research will take the form of extending paths already well trodden, that he will refrain from experiments with unknown drugs, and those dreadful researches which tend to merge the chemist and biologist in the alchemist and the magician. And he certainly does not intend to experiment further on the nerves of any living thing, even his own. The professor had already done enough work to make the reputation of half a dozen ordinary scientists. He may be pardoned if he rests on his laurels, entwining them to some extent with roses. The bottle, containing the drug from the South Seas, was knocked down on the day of his death 
and swept up in bits by the laboratory boy. It is a curious fact that the professor has wholly forgotten the formulae of his great discovery, the notes of which he destroyed just before his experiment, which so nearly was his last. This is a great satisfaction to his wife, and possibly to the professor. But of this I cannot be sure, the scientific spirit survives much. To the unscientific reader, the strangest part of this story will perhaps be the fact that Parker is still with his old master, a wonderful example of the perfect butler. Professor Boyd Thompson was able to forgive Parker, because he understood him, and he learned to understand Parker in those moments of agony, when his keen intellect and his awakened heart taught him, through his love for Lucilla, the depth of that gulf of fear which lies between the quick and the dead.